Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Jason Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. We want to welcome those who are watching the stream, the vidcast, the podcast, however you're tuning in to us. We also welcome you in Eloy and Florence Prison. We praise God that you're joining us. If you're, uh, <clears throat> if you're able to watch the Wake Up Show, we'd encourage you to do that as well. Father God, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for this morning. I ask the Lord that you bless this time. That you open up our hearts to receive your word, which is bread. It's the bread of life. And that we need that, that it's practical for us, and we can use it this week. Lord, that also your word is seed. And it comes to our hearts, and it grows us, and it changes us on the inside, and produces fruit in our lives. Holy Spirit, be our teacher, and teach us what we need to know. Prepare us for what's coming in our lives. And Spirit of God, partner with me. And help me speak truth in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, I'm doing a, a series on manger things. And when Jesus was born and he came to this planet, Emmanuel, God with us, and they wrapped the baby in a swaddling cloth and they lay him in a manger. A lot of things began to happen. People began to gather. Jesus is a gatherer and he says, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So, Here's Jesus, stars are leading, angels are singing, and are drawing people to Christ. And so wise men, magi, are traveling from the east. They traveled as much as a year or two years to get to him. We've got shepherds who are traveling to see the baby Jesus. And so Jesus is on the ground in body form, right? He's hit the planet now in the flesh, and everything in life's about to change. And the angels are singing, peace on earth and goodwill to man. Why? Because the Prince of Peace just showed up and a new covenant has arrived. Now, I want to talk to you about today a meeting with Jesus, right? A come to, we're going to have a come to Jesus meeting today. And there's a story in Genesis chapter 14, right after Abraham has defeated these four kings and rescued his family, which we talked about last week, and you can watch that uh, last week if you missed it. He comes back and he runs into a, a priest. It's, the Bible says that the Melchizedek, the king of Salem and high priest of God, most high, he's the high priest, shows up to meet with Abraham. We find out in Hebrews chapter 7 that this Melchizedek is a picture of Christ. And when he meets with Abraham, he has three things on his agenda that he'd like to cover with Abraham in the meeting. And it's the same for you and I, that when we meet with Jesus, when we, he's with us all the time. How many know he's with you all the time? Yes. But then there's times when we have a meeting. Yes. Okay, so I'm with my, my brother and I, we work together. We both pastor this church. I love working with my brother. And I'm with him all the time sometimes. <laughs> and, but some did that come out funny? I didn't mean that to. <laughs> I apologize. Can we erase that? Um, I love my brother. He's my best friend. Sometimes we have to have a meeting, though, and it's different. Hey, Tuesday, we're going to have a lunch meeting, and we have an agenda. When I was in Africa, I was with Brother Benjamin Kamenapali all the time, like 24-7 while I was there. The 10 days that I was there, I was with him 24-7, okay? So I was with him all the time, but then, Brother Jason, I would like to have lunch with you tomorrow. Well, we have lunch every We're having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I would like to speak to you about a great number of things. So what was he saying is we're going to have a meeting, so this is different than what we've been doing. We've been chatting, but now we're going to have a meeting. And so, Brother Jason, I'm so glad that you're here. And he had an agenda. These are the things that I would like to do. I had an agenda, too. There's some things I'd like to discuss with you, because here's the fact, right? We were trying to drive to a church on Sunday out in the middle of nowhere, uh, an hour and a half drive down a muddy road, because it was the rainy time, which it's always raining there, so I guess every season's the rainy season there. And we got stuck in the mud, and I couldn't go. And so uh, we, we weren't able to go. We're, no, actually, we were able to go, but we were like an hour and a half behind schedule because we had to dig ourselves out of the mud. Okay, so, and it was a four-wheel drive van, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't, because it's so bad, we slipped down into the ditch, and it's this long, whole story. And I said to Brother Benjamin, look, you need a four-wheel drive. If you're going to manage us building 10 to 20 churches and schools out here, how are you going to manage this project and be out on the site every day if you can't drive there? So I had it on my agenda. You need a four-wheel drive car. 
I do not have the ability to do that. I said, well, I'm going to pray, and some businessman back in Arizona, some businessman or woman is going to buy you a four-wheel drive car so that you can do the work of the Lord. So by the way, if you're in this house right now and God moves on your heart, we need about $15,000 to buy this man a four-wheel drive car so he can do the ministry of God. Somebody say amen. You're like, well, that ain't me. So, so he has his agenda, I have my agenda, and we're going through our agenda to get some stuff done in the meeting. Jesus, in the same way, has a, an agenda for you in the meeting, that, he, that when he meets with you. And so he meets with Abraham, and we see his agenda. These are the three things on his mind that he wants to get out, and he wants to go over with you while he's with you. So he, he meets with Abraham. Let's, let's look at it now in Genesis chapter 14. Then Mel, Melchizedek, I'm using the, the ancient Hebrew, the way I'm pronouncing it, it means king. Of righteousness. Malik said, a king of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. So, first thing he did, he brought out bread and wine. Second thing he did, and he blessed him. Second thing Jesus wants to do when he meets with you is he wants to bless you. Somebody say amen. And he's, he blessed him and said, Blessed be, no, no, go back up. Wait, where am I? Yeah, yeah. Blessed be God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Next verse. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies. Into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. The, now, the book of Hebrews says it a little bit different because Hebrews is in the New Testament, it draws out some revelation that was happening in this Old Testament meeting. And when he draws it out, he says, When Abraham returned from the defeat of the kings, he ran into this guy named Melchizedek. And then it goes through and breaks down his name. It says, Now, his name, Melchizedek, means king of righteousness, but also king of Salem means king of peace. How many know that Jesus is our prince of peace? And then he brings out without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, he resembles the son of God and remains priest forever. So this is a picture of Christ, hits the planet and takes a meeting with Abraham. And it brings out here that although it says that Abraham in Genesis chapter 14 gave the tithe, it brings out here that, that Melech said it collected the tithe. And so we're going to go over these three things that are on Jesus' mind when he meets with you. He wants to bring you bread and wine. Okay, he wants to bless you. And he wants to collect the tithe. And this is, this is, his, this is your meeting with Jesus this morning. You came into God's house. And he's taking a meeting with you. And the first thing I want to draw out then is he brings him bread and wine. Okay, so the bread and wine, when you come into God's house and you take a meeting with Jesus, what's the first thing that he's doing? He say, it says that he, re, he returned from having defeated the kings and Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. Right? Who brought the food? See, God's creating or, or preparing a banqueting table in the presence of your enemies. Right? He's going to feed you. And what does that mean? Now, you're not among enemies in here. But the whole world is filled with people who don't like us, who don't like you. I don't know why they don't like you, and I don't know why they don't like me, because I'm nice. But sometimes people don't like you. And they didn't like Jesus, and he was full of love. Somebody say, amen. Well, people don't like you, they must, you must have a problem. Jesus didn't have no problem. They didn't like him at all. The, more you, the closer you get to loving God's way, the more people are not going to like you. But then God gave you favor. Somebody say, Amen. It's all kinds of wonderful people going to like you. Okay. And so he brings out bread and wine. Who prepared this meal? He did. He did the work. Jesus brought out the... What did he say? He said, come and get some bread without cost. All who have no money, come and buy wine and milk without cost. Why? He doesn't want your cost. He doesn't need you to pay for it. He doesn't need you to prepare it. He doesn't need you to do any work at all. He just wants you to sit down. And you just got back from defeating the kings over the last six days. I don't know who the kings are, but you just got back from a battle. How many know that Monday through Saturday can be a battle in your life? It can be trouble. There can be stuff. Like you, just, you saw stuff you didn't need to see. You fought with people you shouldn't have fought with. You did stuff you shouldn't have done. You said things you shouldn't have said. You got other people say stuff about you that hurts you. You got your feelings hurt. You, got, you were in the battle, man. You were in the fight. Maybe you were taking some territory. Maybe you were fighting and quoting scripture, and you were standing against the wiles of the enemy, and he was shooting all his fiery darts. How many know he just likes to fire darts at you sometimes? You just dodge him. You're like the Matrix. You're like, Vroom. Vroom. You're like, you're like Obi-Wan Kenobi with the lightsabers. Ping, ping. I don't know what you're doing, but you had a battle. Praise God, Star Wars is coming out next week, and I just, 
I believe that's in the book of Revelations. It's like the fifth or sixth seal has been broken because the... I'm just kidding. The angels blew trumpets and I saw the... Anyways. <laughs> and so you had your big fight. And what does Jesus do? He says, now sit down. So you come into the house and he says, enter my house of rest. Let me feed you. Let me restore you. Abraham, you just had a big battle. Sit down, man. Let me feed you. I'm like, he brought out bread and he brought out wine. What's the bread? The bread is the bread of life. Right? Jesus said that I'm the bread of life. My words are spirit and they're life. Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's going to give you what you actually need. You are eating from the bread of affliction, but God's like, I don't want you to eat the, from the bread of affliction right now. I want you to eat some bread of life. I got to restore you. And what's he doing? He begins to give you information that you need. Right? Because Satan operates greatest in your life in the playground of things that you don't know. When I don't know what to do, that's where he likes to play. When I don't know what God said, that's where he wants to play. Because he can twist you. He can get, well, I think I kind of know a scripture. And then if you just kind of know it, man, he'll, he'll mess it up because he'll even use scripture to twist you all up and knock you down. Okay, so what's he going to do? It's the stuff you don't know is where he's going to operate. Eve, you should eat from this fruit, man. But God said, he's like, did God really say? Well, she didn't hear God say, she heard Adam say. Adam told me what God said. And man, that man is wrong about everything. He can't remember, he can't remember how to tie his shoes, he didn't even have shoes. Right? So how is he going to tell me what God said? So she starts to doubt what God said. So Satan wants to play in the playground of what you don't know. And God's trying to get you information that you need. And so the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15 that we have a high priest who is the mediator between God and man. But he is the mediator of a new covenant. Say new covenant. He's not mediating an old covenant. The Spirit of God is not talking to you about an old covenant. He's talking to you about a new covenant. The Spirit of God does not speak in the language of condemnation or sin or your problems or your, how, you're, how you're no good. He doesn't talk in that language. He talks in the language of the new covenant. Yeah. And so Jesus, right, is the mediator of a new covenant, and he's between God and the people. So what's he doing? He's looking at what God has and what you need. So he looks at your life and he says, oh, I know some information that you need. See, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says this, my people are destroyed for a lack of da'at, which is the word knowledge. It's not the word vision, it's the word knowledge. Da'at in the Hebrew is, is knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. What does that mean? It means I can have all the power of God working in my life, but if I don't know how to love my wife, if I don't know how to be married, if I don't have the information that I need to grow a business, if I don't have the information that I need on how to talk to people, if I don't have the right information... I will continue to be destroyed in my life. I got all the power of God. Lord, I can prophesy to the mountains. I can move mountains. But if I can't love my wife, I'm like a resounding gong, man. And my marriage is a mess. And I'm not happy when my marriage is, is a mess. What did I need? I needed more information. You see, you didn't know that your depression was the result of, of listening to over and over again what the world is telling you. But if you will learn what God is telling you, what is he saying? I got some information that you need. He says, I want you to rejoice in the grief and the sufferings that you have. I want you to learn how to be thankful in every circumstance, even the bad circumstances. I didn't do it to you, but I did get you through it. Somebody say amen. And he'll say, I want you to consider it pure joy when you experience trials of many kinds, because we know that the testing of our faith produces Perseverance and the perseverance when it has its work in us makes us complete and lacking nothing. And so I'm he's reprogramming that you didn't know that he gave you a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. You didn't know that you have the oil of joy for mourning. You didn't know that God is the comforter of those who are, are grieving. You didn't know that the joy of the Lord was your strength. And the reason you feel weak is because you haven't tapped into the joy that's of him. You've been trying to muster up your own joy. But Jesus said, I, my joy is in you. I do not give as the world gives. And my joy will make you complete. You just didn't know. You didn't know that Jesus wanted to restore your family. You didn't know. 
We didn't know. So we're, we're dealing with drama and we're dealing with all these problems in our family. We didn't know that Jesus cared about our family and that he took territory and opened up a window and spoke over my house. Peace beyond your house. You just didn't, we didn't know. We didn't know that when he restores all that was lost, he was going to restore to us double. But when we find out what God said and he brings us knowledge that we need, he's like, you lost a lot. You're like, I know I lost a lot. And he's like, and Jesus goes like this. He's goes, let me see what God's got that you need. Oh, he's got double restoration for you. There was a man, there was a man came to church six months ago and, and, and he had lost everything in, in like 2008 in the crash, lost everything. And then he, came, he hadn't been to church in, in like six years or eight years or something. He came to church that weekend and found out that God had double restoration for him. Hallelujah. Planted himself in that word. Got plugged back in and planted in God's house. Come on. Kept coming to church. Yes. And within six months, God had restored double everything he had lost. And he said, I just didn't know. I didn't know that God could restore double. So Satan's operating in an environment of our ignorance in the playground of the things that we don't know and the things that we buy into from the world. We think that the world's message has more weight or more knowledge or you had some uh, teacher in M at MCC who taught you world religion, who told you that, that God's bad and Christianity doesn't work and you bought a message that was a lie from the pit of hell because you didn't elevate the truth of God. You didn't elevate and recognize that God's word has power in it. That the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to me who is being saved, it is the power of God. Lord Jesus, you just didn't know. But then, boom, you experienced it. And so the bread of life, right? The three wise men, or it wasn't three. It was a bunch of wise men. We don't know how many it was, but in the, in the greeting cards, it's always three. So let's go with three. I don't know. They traveled a great distance for years following a star to see the king of the Jews. Why? Because wise people are still looking for more knowledge. Even wise people. See, foolish people are done with trying to find more knowledge. I was sitting down next to my brother at, the prayer, at a prayer uh, in Scottsdale, a prayer service, and we brought in a guest speaker, Pastor Steve Hage. And so we're sitting there on a Wednesday night in Scottsdale just a couple weeks ago, and my brother has got his notebook out, and Pastor Steve's teaching, and he's just scribbling, man. He's just scribbling, writing down all Pastor, what Pastor Steve's saying. And you go, man, Pastor Scott, you've been in the Word since you were, like, what, 10 years old or something, man. You know the Bible inside now. You grew up in, in the home with Pastor Maureen Anderson, who's like a walking concordance. Praise God. We've heard every sermon there is to say. We should know it all by now, right? Pastor Scott's scribbling down notes, man. Lots of people aren't scribbling down notes, but Pastor Scott's scribbling. If anybody should not have to take notes, it should be you, Pastor Scott. But the more you find out about God, the more you realize, oh, the depth of the riches of the knowledge and the wisdom of God. The more you learn about God, the more you realize, I just don't know yet. I haven't tapped it yet. So I start teasing my brother, but he's teasing me because I was taking notes too. Piles and piles of notes of, of grabbing every valuable word that God wants to give. You see, the Bible doesn't say that you will hear the truth and it will set you free. It says you will know the truth and it will set you free. And if you don't know it, right? See, a lot of people might say, well, you, you know, I know Pastor Kelly. Look, you do not know Pastor Kelly the way I know Pastor Kelly. Somebody say amen. See, I know Kevin, but I do not know Kevin the way Christy knows Kevin. Come on, somebody. And the Bible says that when Adam knew Eve, they had a kid. See, when he knew her, the word yada which in the Hebrew is knew her. And we've got to yada the word of God. We've got to let the word. Pastor Tom was speaking a word this morning. He said, we've got to get the word of God in us and we conceive it, Lord Jesus. It impregnates us and it begins to give birth on the inside of us. And this is how you birth the things of God. You've got to know the word. You can't just, what pastor preach on? I don't, I think he was talking about, I don't know, he yelled a lot and then he spit on me. I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit three rows back from now on. I don't. It was good though. I remember laughing. He made me laugh. No, we got to know the word. We got to log it down in us. The second thing he did was he brought out the wine. And the wine is the new covenant. When Jesus meets with you, he wants to remind you that you are the righteousness of God. See, when you have a priest, his job in the Old Testament was to 
was to atone for you and create a situation where you were reconciled to God. That's why you got a priest. You got a priest because you wanted somebody that could figure out between you and God. All right, I need some, and so the priest's responsibility was to make you acceptable to God. That was the responsibility. So the Levitical priesthood, they would offer their blood of goats and the blood of bulls, and they would go before the mercy seat. The high priest would enter into the most holy place and offer sacrifices to make to atone for the sins of the people and to make them acceptable before God. That was his job. But the Bible says that the bloats, the blood of goats and bulls in Hebrews chapter 9 will, were not able to forgive the sins of the people. But now we have a high priest who has cleansed us. Somebody say amen. So Jesus, listen to me now, his job, the wine represents the new covenant. Remember Jesus said, this is the cup of a new covenant, the forgiveness of sins. So this is the wine, and he held up the wine. This is blood. And so his job is to reconcile you to God. That's his job, not your job, it's his job. It's your, he's your high priest, it's his job to reconcile you to God. You can't reconcile yourself to God, but he can do it. What's he going to do? Make God a sinner so that you can be reconciled to him? No. He can't make God a sinner, so he has to make you righteous. But it's his job to make you righteous. Therefore, he was able to save completely those who came to God through him. Put it up there. Hebrews chapter something or other. Hebrews chapter... Where is it? 725. Therefore, he is able. Who is able? He is able. Is he able? Yeah, to save completely. How much? Those who come to God through him. Or it says in, in the book of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that he will keep you firm until the very end. Who will keep you firm until the end? Jesus. Who will do it? You? You're going to do it? You're going to keep yourself firm till the end? Well, you got born again, but now you got to keep yourself, man. Got to keep yourself holy. No, no, no. He's going to keep you holy. Is he able to do it? Yeah, he's able to save completely. Therefore, he will keep you firm until the end so that you will be found blameless on the last day. Is it there? Blameless on the, last, on the day of our Lord. You'll be found blameless. Who's going to make sure you're found blameless? Jesus. Well, I say it like you mean it, church. Come on. Who's going to make you? Who's going to make sure? You can't make sure that you're going to be found blameless on the, on the day of the Lord, but he can. Who's responsible to keep you? Through, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 or something, through one sacrifice, he has made us perfect forever. Through one sacrifice, one sacrifice, he died once. Bloods and the, the blood of goats and bulls couldn't do it. And they had to do it all the time to try and atone for the sins of man. But Jesus, man, he's just like, boom, through the one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those, I'm one of those, come on, somebody, who are being made holy. Is that you? Who made you perfect? Is it forever? Forever is how long? Forever. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that, that God demonstrates his righteousness so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So who justifies? God is just, but he's the one who justifies. He, you didn't justify yourself. He justified you. You are not a sinner. You're the righteousness of God. This is the new covenant. He's trying to bring it to you. Why? What's Jesus doing? He's saying, I, I'm responsible to make sure you're reconciled to God, so I'm going to make you righteous. Yeah. I'm going to do it through my blood. I'm going to do it through my sacrifice. I'm going to do all the work for you. Sit down. Sit down. Oh, I'm such a sinner. You're forgiven. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Yeah. Well, he's still counting mine. No, he is not. He lost his calculator when it came to sin. All he sees in you is the good things that Jesus put on the inside of you. You are hidden in Christ, born of an incorruptible seed. You can't corrupt incorruptible seed. And he is a priest forever. 
And so he brings out the wine, the new covenant, and he's doing that for us this morning. He is responsible to do the work. Next thing he does is he blesses Abraham. And Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 6 says, This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi. He wasn't of the law priesthood. He was before the law, as Melech Zedek, 430 years before the law, is when he did this. Then the law came and established a new priesthood under Levi. But when Jesus came, he established the priesthood that God promised him in Psalms 110, when God said, I have sworn and will not change my mind, I have made you a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So the Levitical priesthood had nothing to do with Christ's priesthood. Nothing. And the priest administers the law, but the, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8 that when there's a, a change of the priesthood, Hebrews chapter 7, that when there's a change in the priesthood, that the law must also change. So Jesus didn't come to administer the old Levitical law, but he came. Remember, he was the first priest and he was our last priest. He's our alpha and he's our omega. He is outside of the, that law. Even though he lived it and fulfilled it, he does not administer it to us. That's not the high priest he is. Okay, so... It says, he did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. I love how it says this phrase, he blessed him who had the promises. All right, something deep here. I'm going to share it in three minutes. And then I got another three minutes to share the next part. So why would you bless somebody who's already blessed? This is my question to God. I ask God weird questions. I go, I say to God, are you taping this? I like that. Or are you just playing on Facebook right now? Facebook, Facebook Live. <laughs> so, does it say if anybody's watching, does it say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey. So, so I'm going to ask you guys out there, why would God send a man to bless Abraham when God had already blessed him? And people do that. Well, why do I need the blessing? God already blessed me. Well, we've got to read the word. Okay? So why did he send a man to bless Abraham when God had blessed him in Genesis chapter 12? God blessed Abraham. So why send a man to bless him? Because, so God said to me, because the man blessing, the man of God blessing is different than the God blessing. Right. Okay. They have to be different. There was still something missing. Even though God had blessed Abraham, there was still something missing. So he sent a man of God to bless Abraham. So what is that? What is it that we need? You see, God wanted to heal the crippled man in Jesus' day. It was his will to heal that crippled man. But he needed the man of God to say it and do it. See, a man is required on this planet to manifest the miracle power of God. He wor- and I, so when I say man, I talk about men and women. Right? There's no distinction in the spirit. In Christ, there's no, neither male nor female. I'm just, I just use the word man, okay? So, in order to heal the blind man, in order to heal the leper, in order to heal the woman with the issue of blood, it required a man. God wanted to heal that woman with the issue of blood, but he needed a man to manifest the miracle. Do you see that? So there were things that the man, because a man has a body that's physical and the spirit of God. Okay? So... The body, so God does not have a physical body. So in other words, God is spirit. So God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Yes. I'm downtown right now. I get out my phone and start typing junk. Right? So God has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing. It says in 1 Peter, so that the eternal promises of God will not be contaminated. They're held in, in heaven for you to draw down. But the Bible also says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15 that Jesus was the mediator between God and man. And then it goes on today to say, so that man might receive yes, yes. the inheritance that was promised of God. So there was the need for a physical man to position you to receive the spiritual blessing. Or in other words, what can I give you? Paul said this in Romans chapter uh, 1. He said, I long to see you so that I might impart, say impart, impart. some spiritual gift to make you strong. You say, well, what, 
Well, hold on for a second. A couple of questions that I have to ask here. Don't I already have everything that God put in me? But Paul's like, no, no, there's something I can give you that God hasn't given you. What? A physical experience of a spiritual promise. See, Paul's like, look, I know what the Spirit of God has promised me, but I've seen some things in my life manifest that maybe you haven't seen. I've actually been to some places that were spiritual that have actually man. See, I was in prison and I was praising God and chains fell off. See, I raised the dead. See, I I prayed over a crippled man and I saw him get up. I have seen God meet my needs when I had no way and I had no answer. But I can pray for you. Praise God. So what was he saying? Woo! Let me get there. Let me get there. What was he saying? I can't give it to you by writing it down. I've got to see you to impart this gift to you. I've got to be in the physical atmosphere with you because something's going to break when we get in the same room, when we get in the same place, when I can see you. What does it say in the Bible? It says, when Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. In other words, they were sick. And it says that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. But when he saw them, he was able to impart to them the healing that they needed. They needed healing, but until he got there and in their atmosphere, he couldn't move. Why? Because a physical being was necessary to impart a spiritual experience. See, when I bring Gary Cassie out here to speak to you about money, people might say, well, I'll just read his book. Look, anybody can do that. Well, I just listened to him online. Look, anybody can do that. That's great. But he longs to see you that he might impart something to you spiritually. He's going to get... See, he's been some places about God's wealth that maybe many of us haven't been yet. He's seen finances come to the kingdom in ways that maybe we haven't actually experienced. We know the promise, but he has manifested an experience that maybe we haven't seen yet. And so we can say, man of God... And we recognize the man of God and we get in the room so that he can see me and then he can impart to me something spiritual. And when you get an impartation, you get a teleportation of your faith. You see that? I want my faith teleported because there's some men of God and some women of God that have been places that I haven't been yet. I don't have to start from scratch. I can submit to the man of God. Now listen to me. When, when Jesus came to his own hometown, they recognized his humanity and not his anointing. So they didn't see him as a man of God. They just saw him as a carpenter. So they could, it says that he could, do no, he could do no miracles among them. See, how I see the man of God will determine what I can receive from the man of God. Were they right? Physically speaking. Yeah, he was just a carpenter boy. Physically speaking, they were right about him because they didn't recognize the anointing that was on his life. They saw the humanity, not the spiritual side of him. So how I, re- how I see someone determines how I receive from them. If I can see the anointing, see, I have men of God in my life. My mom's a man of God in my life, praise God. She can speak into my life. My dad's a man of God in my life. Praise God. I got man of God in my life. And I have to learn how to see them, not just as my mom and dad, but I have to see them as anointed of God to speak manifestation. But lay your hands on me, Pastor Tom. I need some of the experience that you've had in your life that I don't have to rewind, but I can start from where you're leaving off. Praise God. I met with Phil Godot the other day and I, you know, I, I, I texted him. I'm like, can you have lunch with me? He's a man of God. I said, have lunch with me. And I get in lunch and we want to chit chat and stuff. But you know what I want is I want you to bless me, brother. I need your blessing. Can you put your hands on me? I submit to you, man of God. I see the anointing of God on your life. And if I will see you as a man of God, I will receive things from you and I will get a teleportation of my faith. Come on, somebody. See, we need God in our life, but we also need a man of God in our life. We need God and we need a man of God. We need the God blessing. We need the man of God blessing. God God said to the Israelites, I bless the Israelites, but then also I'm going to have the Levites bless them too. We need the God blessing, but we need the man of God blessing. Somebody, is there somebody here in this church today that knows what I'm talking about? And sometimes people get so arrogant, they think they know so much that they know more than everybody else. 
so that I'm not going to listen to it. I don't have a man of God in my life no more because I already know everything about the Bible. Look, you must know very little about the Bible because the more I learn about it, the more I realize I don't know. And I want to absorb as much as I can while I'm on this planet. So I recognize and see the anointing of God on people. I know they have humanity too, but I see I'm looking for the anointing. I'm not looking for the humanity. I cover the humanity with love, but I'm looking for that anointing because I say, bless me, man. Put your hands on me. I want what you've got. And the third thing that Jesus does is he collects the tithes. So let's uh, 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 pull down for a second, guys. And I've got a few minutes, so let me, let me hit this because I want to hit it right. The, if you were to ask me six things that I do in my life that make my Christianity work, right? P- people sometimes say, Pastor Jason, how, how's, you're so blessed. You're so, you know, people are so nice. Look, <clears throat> God uses the foolish to confound the wise, right? That's, that's me. <laughs> uh, I sometimes just feel like a donkey jawbone on this planet. And I just say, Jesus, you be my Samson. You the don- use the donkey jawbone however you want. Right? You speak through me. Okay? So, but people say, well, look at all this. You know, God's just working. You're like, yeah, look. You know, praise God for it. Give me six things that you do. One of them would be tithing. It would never stop. I started tithing when I was 19 or 20 years old. Never, ever stopped. I don't skip when I'm on vacation. I know that tithing positions my heart in the kingdom of God. It positions my heart. Where my heart, where my treasure is, there also is my heart. I know that tithing positions my heart. But I want you to see this now in the scripture. It says that in, in, in Hebrews in chapter 7, and I believe it's in verse 6 through 8, but maybe it's 7 and 8. Let's pull it up now. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth. See this collected. Say collected. He collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Does it go on? Go on. Go to the next verse. And without a doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Look how Abraham positioned himself. He could have been arrogant and said, I don't need, I don't need a man of God. I talk to God all the time. What would I need a man of God for? But he positioned himself underneath Christ. In fact, he was supposed to have a meeting with the king of Sodom. But he skipped the meeting with the king of Sodom in order to meet with the man of God. Sometimes we have meetings that in, interrupt our meeting with the man of God. Don't ever let a meet, some other meeting interrupt your meeting with the man of God. Okay, do you see that? Just elevate the man of God and what he can impart to you over whatever the king of Sodom is going to give you. And without a doubt, the lesser is blessed. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die. That's the Levitical priesthood. But see, the G- Jesus' Levi- priesthood is not established on genealogy. His priesthood is established on this, that he has an indestructible life. Okay, so watch this. But in the other case, by him, that's Jesus, the tenth is collected by him who is declared to be living. So Jesus collects the tithe from Abraham. And then now that he's the resurrected king in our lives, he is still collecting the tithe. I want you to see this as present tense. He is collecting the tithe by him who is living. So when he meets with us, he's still collecting the tithe, right? He comes to you and he says, oh, uh, check this out. There's information that God has that you don't have. Let me get it to you. Boom. Where he's reconciling things. He says, oh, you, you don't think you're righteous, but you are righteous. Let me make you righteous. I will make sure that you're the justified. Okay, I'm going to make sure that you're holy. I'm going to elevate you so that you're reconciled to God. You're the righteous of God. You're a saint. So boom, he puts you up there. He says, let me bless you. Let me look at, oh, there's stuff that you need that God has. Can I get this into your life? I'm going to manifest something from the spiritual into the physical for you. You need that. Let me get it for you from God. And then he looks at you and he says, uh-oh, you have something that's God's. Now let me collect that from you. You see what he's doing? He's reconciling us. Oh, oh, you, oh, you still have the 10%? What did he say? When he blessed him, he said this, Blessed be God most high who has delivered the enemy, your enemies, into your hand. So what was he saying? He was saying those kings that you just defeated with your 318 mighty men, You think you beat four kings with 318 men? Is that what you think? You think the victory that you had in your life actually was yours? Let me tell you something. The victory that you just had was from God. That's what he was saying. You didn't beat four kings with 318. God delivered your enemy into your hand. That victory you just had actually belongs to God. And so then it says right after that, and he collected a tenth. Right? He was like, God gave you that. Now give me your 10%. Right? Because that's his. It's not yours. It's his. What is he? See, God, Alpha and Omega, comes to you and says, I want to have an economic partnership with you. I'm tired of you living in lack. 
I'm tired of you living on daily man and you barely have enough to meet your needs. I want to have an economic partnership with you. I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm going to give you opportunities you didn't know were coming your way. I'm going to give you spiritual things that you did not, that are supernatural, that is going to catapult your finances in your life. I'm going to give you ideas for businesses that you did. They're going to come from me. They're not going to come from you. And I'm going to have a partnership with you in your finances. And, and, but I want, to, I want to cut. God says, I want to cut. And so then he says to you, what, do you what, what, what are you willing to give me? And you say, well, geez, I think it should be at least 50-50. And he says, no, no, I just want 10. I just want, is there somebody here with a $10? $10? You got $10 in your pocket? Anybody and will, willing to, to be part of the next two minutes of my message? If you have $10 in your pocket, just put your hand up in the air. You got $10? Anybody got, I got people in the front. Anybody back a little further? Back a little further. You got $10 in your pocket? Grandpa's got 10 bucks. Well, you got ten dollars. You got ten. Okay. Okay. If I give you a hundred dollars, will you give me that ten dollars? Absolutely. I got twenty. There you go. Now, just so you know, church, that's my hundred dollars. I got that out of the ATM yesterday. And she gave me her ten dollars. Now, why is it we're willing? Now, listen to me. Why is it we're willing to trust a man when God says the same thing to you, and we say no way? You trust me? You trust me more than God, really, with your money? No wonder you keep getting the wrong financial outcome. It's because you trust me more than you trust God when it comes to your money. Oh, give the Lord some praise. Father God, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for this word that you've given us today. I thank you, Lord, that you minister this to us, Lord, that it's your, your desire to bring us bread and wine. It's your desire to bring us the blessing. And that, Lord, we might be faithful with all that you've given us to return that 10% back to you in Jesus' name. And, Lord, there's no condemnation for those people who have been here who have been struggling to give that 10th. Lord, I, I know that you intercede, Father God, that you're the mediator. And, Lord, that, Father God, that you would be the strength on the inside of them. Father God, that you would bring the resource and the victory to make it possible. And, Lord, that you would be the faith on the inside of them. That they would just have the resolve to trust you and to step out of that boat out under the water and make it happen. And we know, Lord, that you meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Woo! We hope you enjoyed today. Thank you for watching. Oh, it was incredible. Yeah. It's so Give good. me another point. I want more. I want uno mas. <laughs> well, the three main points are, are just recognizing that this is what Jesus has on his agenda when he meets with you. When he sits down with you and, and wants to... Go over what's on his agenda, what's on his mind. Oh. He's like, bread, wine, let's get you blessed. You got some me, people excited me, there. So what, what he does is he's mediating between what's missing in your life that God has and what you have that belongs to God. This is what he's, That's what a mediator and a priest does. Wow. Hey, we're going to continue the conversation on our daily Bible study. Wake up every single morning, Monday through Friday. Got a scripture, got a great word. We have a whole lot of fun. Yeah. But what's great for us is we get to continue the conversation. Yeah. So we can take this message and go a whole lot deeper. So if you want to subscribe, we send you a little text every day. We we'll see you every morning. Also, hey, you've been blessed today. My daddy always said when you get blessed, make sure you're blessing back. And of course, your tithe always goes to your local church. But then over and above that, give an offering so that we can continue to bring this message all over the world. And so we need you. Yeah, when you and when you give, attach faith to that gift. You right. know? The other day I was, I've been praying to try and sell a truck. I buy and sell cars a little bit on the side. And uh, the Lord just spoke to me and said, sow a seed into that, you know, as you're praying that faith. And so I sowed a seed and uh, it was really cool. I sowed it that morning and it's almost like God showing off sometimes. That, <laughs> this, I does. preached that morning. Yeah. Okay. So I'm driving back from Scottsdale. Um, it's like one o'clock in the afternoon. I got a phone call from a guy in a different state and he's like, yeah, I want to buy that truck. And he drove that night across state to buy the truck, wow. and, which means that God was like, okay, I got a buyer, but he lives in a different state. <laughs> Let me figure this out. Yeah. And so there's something happens in our faith. And so I just encourage you to be generous and so with faith in mind. I love that. I God shows a, off your book. I have a book uh, I have, called Women Teaching in the Church. Ooh, and, he's uh, progressive. <laughs> we see women teaching in church, but we also hear the question a lot. Why do you let women teach in church? And uh, Because yeah, they're so, better. And so maybe you're like, well, I've never asked that question. Look, it's not about whether you've asked or not. It's about equipping you with the information you need so when you come across someone 
that is questioning this kind of thing, that you have the information, the armor that right. you need uh, to, to help them understand the importance that, that the Holy Spirit knows no male or female, knows no Greek or Jew. Jew the Holy or... Spirit just comes in and has all kinds of gifts for us to share with the world. It's crazy to think about that the enemy for, and still today, has silenced half yeah. of the body. Why does a lot of pastors what? need to read this they do. across America? And so, hey, you know, if you're not saved, we want to give you that opportunity right now. It's very simple. It's very easy. We're going to say a prayer. Believe it and you have it. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't be somehow good enough. Bible says that no one will get to heaven through their work so that they may boast. Because God said, I sent my son to die for all of your sins. Everything mm-hmm. you've done, everything you're going to do. And he says, whosoever believes has eternal life. And so if you'll believe with us, you're saved. It's simple, it's easy. Say this prayer with us. Dear me, Father, I ask you right now, forgive me of all of my sins. I ask you to Jesus come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you're saved. Let somebody know. I think it's good. You can let us know, comment, whatever it might be. But now the step is get into church. You need church in your life. Wherever you live, find a church that you can go to every single week. Remember, the anointing breaks the yokes. We get into that gathering. We hear the word together as a group. It's great that you're watching the stream too. And we appreciate it. But make sure you're in a local church every week. Be blessed. We'll see you on the Wake Up Show tomorrow.